Next up, we have session three, Extending Your Brand Beyond Functional Food, and that'll be kicked off by Laurel Ashbrook. She'll explain why a good product is no longer good enough in food and beverage. Consumers want products that are eco-friendly, healthy, or, eth or ethically sourced, and ideally all of the above. The good news is that this opens a new world of business opportunities. Laurel, over to you. Hello, everybody. Um, it's kind of intimidating to follow that keynote speaker, but uh, hopefully you'll, you'll give me a little leeway here. So i um, glad that you're all hanging in here. I'm really excited to be here and with some fantastic panelists who I'll introduce you to in a, mi in a minute. But as Claire said, kind of the key of what we're going to talk about today is that having a good food, be food and beverage pro product is no longer good enough. Ideally, that good food and beverage product also has to be good for society and good for the planet. And consumers are counting on companies that make these products to own that, to make it better than just good for me, good, but good for others and good for the planet as well. And we see a lot of food and beverage companies leaning into sustainability. I think it's important to know that consumers find it equally important to lean into doing societal good as well. Yet the say-do gap is real. You see on this slide that almost 70% of people are saying, yes, I'm all about wanting to have food and beverage products that are good for myself, good for others, and good for the planet. When we ask them if they're buying products for that reason, less than half will agree that they are. So companies, like all of you, need to help the consumer close that say-do gap. You need to make it easier for consumers to get food and beverage products that are good for them personally, that are good for others, good for society, and that are good for the planet. And we have our head of climate uh, change and sustainability, Dr. Pippa Bailey from the UK, and she brings up this notion of co-benefits. So it's no longer good enough to just be the best food and beverage product out there. You have to offer those co-benefits of sustainability and societal positivity. Here are just a few examples of how some food and beverage companies that have combined into some co-benefits. So good food, good food for Good is an example of combining a really good nutritious product. These are organic, uh, vegan, sugar-free sauces and condiments. And every purchase that is made, this company gives a meal to food insecure households. So each purchase does good for the person and good for others. In the middle, you've got Protein Planets products they are 100% excellent fuel for the body, made in a 100% sustainable way. So here's that combination, the co-benefits of good for the person and good for the planet. And our last example, Huera, a Barcelona-based manufacturer of a series of different food and bev products now. They're the trifecta of all three. Totally sustainably sourced, totally good nutrition, and then additionally, they have built a community of warriors, a place for society and people involved in this sustainable movement for food to get together and share ideas and talk about how we can improve and move our food system forward. Really good news, though. Good for the person, good for others, and good for the planet is also good for you, the company. Companies that have co-benefits outperform the stock market. They also have brands that are four times more likely to be trusted. Polling question.
I hope this is asking you, okay, there you go. So we're gonna talk a little bit about getting next, getting inspiration from consumers for the types of co-benefits they might wanna have. And we're gonna talk about a social media exploration that we did among 600,000 consumers looking at their social conversations over the last six months. And we asked about that in the area of good for me, good for others, good for the planet. So what do you think was the top? Okay, well I'm glad this is kind of fun that you were wrong. So, <laughs> otherwise it would be kind of like, eh, okay, you got it. Uh, I guess I can't move and tell you uh, the truth. Can I tell them the truth now or are we done? No, nope, we're still polling. Can't take your answer back. Oh, it's there? Okay, there we go. Seaweed. So seaweed uh, at 13% was the most prevalent within the conversation around good for me and good for the planet. Um, so what we're showing you here is the challenge for you is to think about what co-benefits you might want to have in your food and beverage products and to get your inspiration from social conversation. We're showing you a little framework of how we did that and learned that What's trending for right now for people in the space of good for me and good for the planet is, as you saw, seaweed, new forms of plant-based protein beyond plant-based meat, and then insects as ingredients. Um, this company was on Shark Tank. We, can't, we, couldn't, we wanted to put the insect-based potato chips in your goodie bags. Unfortunately, <laughs> they are completely out of stock. They're going crazy wild. Um, so insects on the horizon, and we're sorry we couldn't share that with you today. When we looked at good for person and good for society trends, we saw a lot of things come up around food insecurity and food waste, and looked at inspiration around companies that are repurposing food for food insecure households or potentially for animal feed. But you can't stop with just listening to what consumers want. You have to figure out a way to tie that into your own brand to get the right co-benefits. And so I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Joseph Devaney, who runs our innovation practice. And he's going to talk a little bit about taking the socially, um, socially guided inspiration one step further to kind of find that sweet spot of co-benefits. Hello, everybody. Are you all excited to start eating insects? <laughs> Seaweed? No? But it's like it's such a hot trend, and we just saw that. So clearly, this is going to be like, you know, what we need to do and jump on that bandwagon. Um, but I think what I'm trying to emphasize here is obviously chasing a trend on its own can, you know, that can really lead to some lackluster results in market. So I'm here to be like the consumer voice, that conscience, which is all of our jobs, um, and remind everyone that. You know, everything we do, even these hot trends, really need to remain rooted in an uh, actual human need for them to succeed in market. Um, there are various ways we can do that. I think a very tried and true framework that is used quite frequently is the jobs to be done framework. Um, and a lot of companies use this, but often it's really focused on that kind of qualitative exploration, uncovering the jobs. Um, and of course, the goal here is really to shift the focus from the product itself and, and understand what that human need is, what the actual job, you know, what job exists that the product is supposed to do for the consumer. But what we've seen is a growing number of companies really starting to apply more quantitative rigor to the jobs to be done process. So understanding once we've uncovered this 25, you know, this list of 25 jobs, where do we actually want to invest and focus our innovation efforts? Because knowing what the trends are is important, but obviously we want to focus those efforts on manifesting those trends in jobs that really are going to be aligned, one, with the innovation strategy, but then also with core human needs that are going to make business sense in terms of opportunity, return on investment, and so on and so forth. So at Ipsos, you know, typically when we're looking at jobs, we're going to focus on four key things. One, we want to understand you know, across those jobs, you know, how many of them are relevant into how many people, um, and who are those individuals? And then also for the individuals who say, yes, this job actually really resonates with my life, and I have that need, and I have that job to be done, um, is that really happening on this core emotive level? Because obviously to really connect 
we want to make sure that we're connecting not functionally alone, but also on a more intimate emotional plane as well. And then clearly when we're thinking about sizing, we're going to want to be looking at the competitive landscape. So are there already a plethora of options on the market today that you're going to be competing with to meet that need? Um, and also the frequency and the size of the need itself. So is this a need that the individual is having uh, on a daily basis or is this a job that pops up you know, once a year? And all of this can really help us reveal you know, which of these jobs have the most potential. We can take this to a dollar value. And the question is, is this relevant when we're talking about jobs that we're hoping are going to go beyond the functional and actually incorporate, things, incorporate higher level benefits tied to things like sustainability or other higher purpose um, you know, jobs? And the answer is yes, with some tweaks. So when we're thinking about jobs to be done statements, typically they're very much focused in the moment. We talked earlier about impulse buys and really looking at things in the moment. So if we go to the next slide and we see these concentric circles, typically when we think of a job, it's been very focused on me in the moment. So you know, that might be something like after a tough day at work, when I come home, you know, help me make something convenient for my kids that is delicious but not jam-packed full of sugar. And that's great, that's important, but in the context of what we're talking about today and the trends related to sustainability, um, we want to really move that conversation from me to we, which is why the challenge is to push those jobs to something beyond me to perhaps encompass you know, my world, so my family, my immediate community. And this could be an added benefit related to something like allowing them to model good eating habits that their children can take with them to grow into healthy adults. Or ideally, you know, pushing that even one step further to the world at large, and perhaps you know, that extended uh, job to be done is more about, in addition to what I already spoke about, you know, using a product that's sourced from sustainable ingredients that's going to allow future generations to enjoy the product or to live in a, a world that is safe. Um, and it's really by pushing ourselves to extend those jobs outside of the moment of consumption that we can then really assess opportunity, not only in the moment, but then with a more future-focused lens and understand which jobs are going to be ticking those boxes um, in terms of those higher purpose benefits as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Laurel to kick off our, our panel. Our panel. So as I said, we are super excited to have uh, a couple of very different perspectives and people from different um, backgrounds and careers uh, to talk about this notion of co-benefit, good for the person, good for others, good for the planet. I'm gonna let these um, two wonderful panelists introduce themselves. Priyanka, do you wanna start and tell us just a little bit about yourself? Sure, hi everyone. It's really nice to be here and meet you all. Um, this is one of my first in-person panels, finally. I've been doing so many virtual, so I'm like, oh my god, what do I do? Um, but my name is Priyanka Naik. I'm a self-taught vegan and sustainable chef. I'm a Food Network champion. I won a bunch of other shows as well. Uh, I'm an author. I'm a columnist for the Washington Post, uh, and I'm a TV host. So I'm really excited to be here and sort of provide my perspective on not only the culinary industry as a vegan and sustainable chef, but as a consumer in this industry and also um, provide some of the learnings that I've garnered from uh, my very large fan base as well as um, through my Washington Post column that's been quite successful over the past few weeks because it's very evident that more people are willing to be sustainable before they are plant-based or vegan. Um, and I'll take what I can get. So if I can get people to be more sustainable before they're vegan, then let's go with that. So that's who I am. Thank you very much. And Megan, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, hi, I'm Megan Feedy. Um, I work on the Consumer Insights team at Beam Centauri. So you might have enjoyed some of our brands like Jim Beam, Maker's Mark. Hornitos Tequila, On the Rocks Cocktails, um, the list goes on and on, but happy to be here. Awesome, so Megan, I'm actually gonna start with you and ask you to tell us a little bit about how the notion of good for you, good for others, good for the earth is manifesting itself at Beam. Sure. Yeah, 
So at Beam Centauri, we have a proof positive initiative, is what we call it. Um, and this initiative is really enabling us to um, you know, feel committed to those long-term goals and the long-term vision that we have for the company. So we have three pillars under proof positive. There's nature positive, consumer positive, and community positive. Nature positive, um, like it sounds, is um, giving back to the environment, ensuring that we're replenishing those natural resources that we use to make our products. So that would include things like water, climate, forestry, um, and any of the packaging initiatives that we have. Um, the second one is consumer positive, and this one um, might feel a little bit um, surprising to people who don't work in the alcohol industry, but under this initiative, we are doing things like promoting responsible drinking, um, making sure that people are you know, behaving appropriately while they're drinking alcohol and enjoying our products. Um, we're committed to nutritional content, alcohol content, label transparency, so people know what they're drinking. And then also the topic of moderation is something that's really been important um, and really you know, changing the way that people drink, changing the way they think about consuming alcohol. Um, so we're committed to um, having more low alcohol, no alcohol options for people to be able to moderate. And then the third pillar that we have is community positive, which is about making more equitable, equitable workplace, um, but then also um, spearheading volunteering and philanthropic events within our communities. So Megan, why do you think, how did this sort of take root at Beam? Or how do you think it became part of the culture and where did the proof positive come from? Yeah, great question. So, you know, it's really the foundation, I would say, of our company, and then it's also a foundation within our leadership. So Suntory Holdings, the mission statement is to create harmony with people in nature. So it's there within the core, you know, mission statement of our company. And our CEO says something like, when you focus on people, society, and putting the planet first, the money will come. So it really obviously helps a lot to have you know, leadership be um, kicking this off, to be spearheading this for a company, and then obviously creating the initiative, giving the investment, um, and enabling the rest of the organization to do the work. So those three proof positive pillars that I talked about, we have a VP or a chief level that's you know, supporting each one of those pillars, that's responsible for taking action, that created measurable goals to really be held accountable um, to put the action behind the words. So Priyanka, you mentioned that you have a column in the Washington Post, and I'm sure you have exchanged, um, you know, talked with various readers and gotten some feedback. What can you tell us that you've learned about consumers and how consumers may be changing or what they're becoming more interested in um, from your work in the Washington Post? Yeah, so the column is called Eco Kitchen. You can all go sign up, it's free. <laughs> Um, but it's very interesting because uh, some interesting stats around it are I have more, I think like over 70% male subscribers, which I was like, ooh, all the men, they want to be sustainable. <laughs> um, but I just found that interesting because I just, you know, because I'm a woman and most of my general fan base are women, I was like, oh, I'll probably have more women who are subscribed to my column. But it's actually more men, which I found interesting. But what's further interesting is I get a ton of emails. So anyone who has a column with a newspaper, you're, there's an email and I receive a lot of inbound. And some of them are hilarious, like, stop writing this, I hate you. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> but then some, some are like, I love you. And I'm like, great. But then some and most are like, wow, this is so informative. I had, oh, sorry. <laughs> Be. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm vegan, I won't kill it, but I'll run away and scream. Um, but some of them are like, wow, like I didn't realize that you can freeze your scraps and you know, take it to your nearest compost bin or that you know, packing my leftovers at a restaurant and repurposing it into a new dish like really makes a difference. It keeps, those, it keeps that food out of the landfill. So there's a lot of that. There's people who are actually being enlightened by the information that's being provided, which is the whole point of the column. But I think what's the most interesting is I get a ton of emails about like, Actually, I've been doing that. I have been like, huh. you know, reusing um, the paper towel more than one time if I just dry my hands on it. Or I got the cutest email. Um, this gentleman in, I think, Texas was like, I've been following your column and it's been really inspiring and it's inspired me to start 
my own mission with my church and we're calling it the Green Bulletin. So every week we share a green tip with the churchgoers so then they can instill that, you know, habit or tip into their lives. And I was like, oh my God, I'm not sentimental, but I like shed a tear because I was like, that that's the point, right? Is to get people to instill these daily habits into their lives without, it's not gonna cost you anything. It's just changing your habits. And some are like, well, I already do what you're sharing and here are some other things that I do that you may not know of. like. One woman was like with her uh, leftover detergent bottles, once it finishes, her husband drills holes on the top and then she uses it as a watering can. And I was like, oh my God, that's so cute. Like she's repurposing something that you would never think to repurpose. So it occurred to me that there's a few buckets of people. There are people who don't know, you know, much about being eco-friendly at all. And this is a very useful, this is very useful information to them. And then there's a bucket of people who have been doing these things on a daily basis, and you may not even know this because you know they don't have columns, they're not on TV, they don't have blogs, but people at the end of the day want to be more sustainable and they're striving to be, and that's what I meant by earlier that before people are willing to give up meat or go vegan, they're actually more willing to maybe pack their leftovers at a restaurant or freeze their scraps to compost or um, you know, reuse the detergent bottle as a watering can, which I didn't even think to do, but I was like, hey, I, I'm learning so much from my readers, maybe even more so than they're learning from me. So I think it's pretty cool from that regard. So, you know, when you hear Megan talk about Beam Centauri, you know there are companies out there, many, you know, that understand that we need to up, you know, the sustainable part of the product, the societal give back, I mean, what would you personally say to companies, you know, to try to help bring their buyers along in this journey? Well, how transparent can I be here? <laughs> um, I, think, I think for someone who obviously is really deep into the culinary industry with a specific focus on just trying to be better because I'm not perfect and surely no one is, I think what I appreciate about some smaller companies that I support are th is the transparency. So there's, there's full transparency from end to end from how they're sourcing the ingredients, who they're sourcing it from, how they're supporting those farmers, what does that supply chain look like, how does it end up on your grocery store shelf. I think that, especially like I'm a millennial but Gen Z, like that all of that stuff is all over TikTok too, right? Like social media is driving a lot of this. Once there was this kind of relevant but irrelevant, there was that one TikToker who went completely viral, I think a couple years ago for showing what they do at the end of the day at Dunkin' Donuts. I don't know if you guys saw that one, but they like toss all the donuts out and everyone like freaked out. Like that's the type of stuff that really like, you know, shocks people because you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. So when you have smaller brands and companies who are like saying, hey, we're sourcing all of our wheat from this farmer in Canada or wherever it is. And this is how it's being like milled and then packaged and then on like it's brought to your grocery store shelf. Someone like me, especially who is a chef, like I very much appreciate that because now I know uh, where my money is going, why this practice is sustainable, and but also like these products tend to be a little bit more expensive, but at least I'm like, well now I know my money's going towards something good because I see the full transparent process in what's happening. But I know that's not necessarily possible for a lot of bigger companies who have multiple brands that they're trying to manage with multiple farms and multiple sources. So I totally understand that perspective of it, but I think if we can provide a little bit more transparency into the practices, um, I think people like me and especially people who aren't necessarily chefs will really appreciate that as well. Excellent. So Megan, back to you. Um, tell us a little bit about what really inspires you at Beam, you know, what brands or initiatives, and kind of more, talk to us a little bit more about how the innovation practices at Beam have been impacted by your, you know, your three pillar strategy. Sure, yeah, so, I mean, I think at the basis of what, what we do as Insights People is really trying to understand consumer behavior, right? So, 
Um, one of the things that we've done is we have taken a lot of steps to better understand moderation. Um, and in that is taking in thought leadership, learning um, from resources that are available, but also partnering with people like, in, like Ipsos who can help us um, understand a bit deeper. So we recently purchased the moderation people segmentation to help us understand how different cohorts of drinkers are behaving differently and how they're um, and we might reach them in different ways depending on the segment. Um, also did a bit more custom research you know, to help understand those things a bit deeper. My fun facts for you are 92% um, of consumer, consumers moderate their drinking behavior in some sort of way, which probably most people in the room can agree with. Um, and 70% of people feel good when they successfully moderate. So our point of view for our brands is we want to be part of that 70%. We want to do the right thing for people and help them along that journey. Um, and as we're thinking about our products, it's not just innovation in creating new products in a low, low alcohol or no alcohol space. It's certainly part of it. Um, but it could be also things like thinking about our packaging and making changes um, to our packaging that consumers see maybe in the unpack or parts of our packaging um, or um, or distilling process or bottling process that maybe consumers don't even see. Um, and then we're also doing things like talking to bartenders, talking about food waste at restaurants and what they're doing while they're making cocktails and how we can better support them um, in the jobs that they do, whether they're using our products in that moment um, or not. Awesome. That, that also makes me think about the fact that as we think about, um, you know, sustainable changes, be that packaging, be it sustainably sourced ingredients, uh, different elements are gonna resonate differently with different audiences. So it's also really understanding who you're marketing the product to. There might be cases where you don't even need to explicitly call attention to some of the, the environmentally friendly activities that the company is undertaking because it's not something that's gonna resonate with your, your audience. So I think understanding your, your core user group is really important, but then you might also discover that there is an incremental user base out there, like Priyanka was talking about, that, that is really gonna want to know exactly where, the, where your product was sourced from. And when you're talking about things like sustainability as it, comes, as it pertains to innovation, particularly if it's going to require behavior change, if you're thinking about introducing a, a new type of packaging that's gonna function different, differently um, in order to be sustainable, that's also gonna require an additional level of education, communication around the change uh, versus a simple ingredient that was sourced from a local form, farm versus um, a, a, another source that had historically been used. So I just think, again, always coming back to understanding you know, who is using my products, what are their needs, what matters to them is gonna influence which elements are uh, going to require additional education, communication, which changes can be made without calling attention to it at all, uh, and so on and so forth. So just something to keep in mind. Yeah, and we unfortunately had a panelist who came down with COVID and couldn't be here, but in some of the pre-conversations, and again with you, Megan, as well, we also talked up the notion of the DNA of the brand and making sure that you're not just trying to force a sustainable element into a brand where that sustainability element doesn't really make sense. And I won't give away too much, but this person was talking about her challenges with someone trying to check the box on carbon neutrality. And she's like, well, this is like a waffle. So I'm not sure that, we're, that, that consumers are gonna connect the dots on that. So yes, we need to be sustainable. We might have a, a carbon equation, but maybe we need something to show that we're committed to sustainability that's more connected into our product, our brand, our DNA. So I think it's who you're talking to, it's what your brand is. It's not just saying we're sustainable or we're good for society, but it's connecting the dots and making that feel authentic for people. So Priyanka, um, we talked a lot, I talked a little bit, and I've heard it here a couple times today about the whole say-do gap, right? So in our poll, you saw that over two-thirds of the people, almost 70%, are saying, I'm all about buying this kind of stuff. But then when you get down to the brass tacks, they're not buying it. So what do you think, how do you think we can help each other close the say-do gap, or how can companies help in, in their buyers close the say-do gap? What thoughts do you have on that? Yeah, I think as individuals, um, there's always this notion that like, well, I'm just one person, what difference can I make? But the reality of the matter is like, it, it starts adding up, right? Like I, 
I feel as someone who has a platform um, and is passionate about this, I have the responsibility to help knowledge share, right? So there's a lot of people like me who are thought leaders in this space who are knowledge sharing, and we have the responsibility to do that. So there is that like me trying to inspire people to, hey, freeze your com like compost and scraps and you know don't throw your pasta water away, water your plants with it, that kind of thing. Like all of that really adds up. So in order to close that say do gap as individuals, we just need to kind of reiterate to ourselves that every individual action that we take on a daily basis does add up and it does keep food out of the landfills. It does help us reduce our carbon footprint. Um, so I'm just of the mind that, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm a very impatient person, so I'm not gonna wait around for some big company or the government to make some huge change because that may not happen in my lifetime. So instead of waiting around for that, I as an individual want to at least put forth as much good um, that I can and I hope that people feel the same way so they understand that their actions um, can make a difference. And then in terms of companies, like I again, I do have a platform, so I have the ability to uh, connect with a lot of these companies. And you know, if I ever talk to them and they're like, oh, we, you know, I do a lot of recipe development for brands, and I will question them and be like, is there palm oil in this, you know, product? Because I don't cook anything with palm oil, and you should look up, you know, why palm oil is detrimental to the environment if you don't know. But like things like that, and many times they do have answers, right? They do have like this is what we're improving. These are sustainability efforts, and that I appreciate. But if they're like, oh well, you know, we don't know yet. We're still like then, yeah. I many times will forfeit a brand partnership because I, it, you know, the company's philosophy doesn't align with mine, and that is that could technically be a huge loss for me as someone who's a content creator in this space too. But at the end of the day, like it has to line up with what I think is doing the right thing. And my kind of mission is just getting people to not think exactly like me, but just try to think more like, if I could put this good in out into the world, then there will be a positive result. I may not see it today, or maybe not even in my lifetime, but probably in the future. And the one thing that I think about, actually, I don't know if anyone watches Chef's Table on Netflix, but if, if you don't, you definitely should. I think it was in the first season, it was um, Dan Barber, who is the chef and founder of Blue, Blue Hill Stone Barn in New York and Hudson Valley. And he said something in it, um, which I'm not quoting right, but he said like, if I'm working towards a goal that is achievable in my lifetime, then I'm not working towards the right goal. And I kind of feel the same in terms of like what I'm doing personally. Like I'm, you know, me composting and being vegan, like that's not gonna, that's not gonna save us all from global warming, me just doing that as one individual. But if I'm able to inspire five, ten, a thousand, hundred thousands of people maybe to do it eventually, then eventually even after I pass, like there will be some change. So I think if we kind of think more long term and broadly, then we'll be more confident in every action we take and sort of making those small changes. Awesome. What about you, Megan? What do you how do you think companies can help consumers, buyers, people close that say do gap? Yeah, I think really we have to make it easy for consumers to do that. So we have to start with having a good product and maintaining or improving the quality of the product, the taste of the product. Anything that we're doing from a nature positive, consumer positive standpoint needs to be kind of an add on. So I think of this area as all kind of an and to my job and to what we do because it's layering on top of the brand promise that we're already making to our consumers. Um, but as a brand, I think about a couple of things. So one, as you were just talking about, um, having a cause that fits the brand, being authentic to the brand is really important. Um, being transparent, just actually telling consumers in simple, easy to understand language, what are the actions your brand is taking and, and what you support, um, and being really clear about that. And then the last one is just being intentional. Um, so being targeted with your message, talking to the, to the right cohort, to your consumer, um, using the right types of media or the right channels to communicate your message. It could be partners, it could be social, it could be video content, um, but just making sure that you're putting your message out there in a way that they can easily understand it. And we do see that thing time and time again that um, you know, there are certain gatekeepers like flavor and food is always going to be king. Like, no one is going to sacrifice on a great tasting product just to know that the, it's in a recyclable package. So, 
you know, it does have to be incremental. And I think figuring out, you know, which elements are going to warrant, um, you know, maybe a higher price point when it comes to sustainability. Again, we call it the say do gap and we're always so focused on the say. And I think it's again, thinking how do we complement that with the do, which is observations. So is that virtual shopping environments and looking at what are they actually engaging with, picking up, buying, um, and complementing that with, you know, uh, survey data is a great way to kind of see where you see it, where, where do the gaps exist. Um, and I think that observation can be really critical in guiding, you know, which elements people are really invested in. Awesome. Well, we are uh, running out of time. I think you guys have been wonderful. Priyanka, I want to give you a chance just to tell everybody very quickly, since you so kindly traveled from New York, to just tell them a little bit about your book. Um, and I think, I'm not sure who's getting them, but we do have some signed copies here. So if you want to just um, sure. give your book a little plug. <laughs> sure, yeah. So uh, my first book, my cookbook, came out in November, uh, very fittingly on World Vegan Day in November 2021. It's called The Modern Tiffin. We have a few copies that I've signed, so if you are interested in grabbing one, you can. And if we run out, then you can support a new author <laughs> and go buy one on Amazon or an indie bookstore. But uh, the, the book is very interesting, and I hope you do take a minute to check it out. Um, it's, it's, it's not often that uh, there's, it's now happening more often, but it's not very often that self-taught chefs are able to get the credibility in the culinary industry, especially as a woman who is brown, who is first generation. Um, it's, it's been an uphill battle. And then to also layer on the veganism and the sustainability, which are now very trendy and hot topics, but formally really were not. And those are all the reasons why I was you know, rejected many a times by networks and brands. So the book kind of encapsulates my life from a culture standpoint and my food philosophy as someone who's vegan and has a lot of sustainable recipes in there as well. And it is very colorful like me so uh, yeah you should check it out and then you can also follow me at chef Priyanka on all the interwebs all the social platforms you can find me there so I want to again thank our wonderful panelists um, chef Priyanka coming to us from New York and being very generous with her time and Megan who um, was not our original pa panelist although she killed it um, but she jumped in what was it a day ago, a day and a half ago, um, because her colleague got COVID. So um, just really grateful to the time and the energy and the contributions you've given up here. So thank you. Thank you.